Hello, I'm Professor Malcolm Keating, and I'll be giving the lecture for Anambutas Primer on Reasoning. This lecture is divided into a few parts, so you can listen audio only, uh, each part at a time if you want, or you can watch it um, as a video. Uh, so let's start with part one. Before we begin, I want to ans ask you a question. I want you to think about whether you think that you can know whether or not God exists. Now, I'm not asking about what Ibn Tufail thinks, but I want to know what you think. Do you think that you can know if God exists or not? Now, maybe you haven't decided if he does, and that's fine. The question is whether you think it's possible to know this, whether you know it right now or not. What do you think? Now, why am I asking you the question like this at the beginning of a lecture on reasoning? Well, in this lecture, I want to challenge you to reflect on your beliefs and why you have them. That's really the topic of this lecture today. Whether you come into PPT as an atheist or an agnostic or a theist or something else, my concern is not particularly about maintaining your beliefs or changing them. Instead, I want you to reflect on the reasons for your belief. Having reasons for your belief was very important to our thinker for this week, who lived in what is now India during the 17th century. His name was Anambutta, and he wrote the Primer on Reasoning. Let's consider why we're reading this text in PPT. So far this semester, um, in fact, this course as a whole, you faced a lot of different questions. You've wondered whether people are political animals, whether the self exists, whether human beings can learn to be virtuous. You want to know, is the self eternal or not? Is ritual a way to learn? Is human nature good? You've thought, am I a butterfly dreaming, or am I dreaming that I am a butterfly? You've thought about whether meditation is a way to learn. You've wondered, can fish be happy? And you've wanted to know, is virtue something that's relative to society or not? And at this point in the course, having all these questions thrown at you and um, you know ones that you thought through yourselves during the course, and many others in addition to this list, you might be wondering, well, how can I know the answer? How do I know if I have the right answer? Well, that's what we're considering today. The thinker we're going to look at today is part of a long tradition that believes that inference is a way that we can come to know things. He thinks that knowledge is possible, though it's not always easy to come by. He thinks we can be fooled by what seem to be good cases of reasoning, which are actually not good cases. And so it's important, according to Nyaya philosophers, to be aware of what it's like to reason well and also to reason badly. That's because the stakes are high. Further, correct inference is involved in debate, and debate's part of everyday human life, whether that's in very formal contexts or informal ones when you debate with your friends whether to stay in and do your PPT homework or go out and do something else. In a restricted sense of the term, though, debate is when two parties reason together in order to find the truth. When we're engaging in debate, it's because there's a question under discussion where those two parties disagree. So there may be a difference of opinion because truth is hard to come by. It's hard to know whether there's a self or not. It's hard to know how to create a just society. It's hard to know how to live. In fact, according to Nyaya philosophers, the stakes involve the highest good for human beings, the stakes involved in reasoning. So let's return to the end of last semester when we read parts of Nyaya texts, including the Nyaya Sutras by Akshapada Gautama. Here are the opening words of that text, it's words that we didn't read. The highest good is reached through an understanding of the true nature of the distinctions between honest, dishonest, and destructive debate of false reasoning, tricks and checks in debate, of the pattern of sound investigation, whose components are doubt, purpose, examples, assumed principles, inference, suppositional reasoning and decision, and of the ways of gaining knowledge and the objects of knowledge. So we want to think about this sentence, which is the first in the Nyaya Sutra, as a thesis statement. It sets out what Gautama is going to demonstrate in his text. Now, his thesis statement is fairly complex, and we're not going to talk about all of these components today. But what I want you to notice is that he's arguing that something he calls the highest good is reached by understanding the true nature of various things. In this thesis sentence, he brings together what contemporary thinkers might call ethics with epistemology and metaphysics. The highest good is the aim of all human beings, and we're already th familiar with thinkers who have considered just what that highest good might be. 
For Nyaya, along with other Hindu philosophers, the ultimate goal for human beings is to end the cycle of rebirth with its suffering and pain. Unlike Buddhist philosophers, however, Nyaya and Hindu philosophers think that there is a self which gets to attain this highest end. And we attain this highest good through understanding the true nature of things, so something like understanding metaphysics the way the world is. Now, I've highlighted here uh, understanding and true nature because they underscore the importance of metaphysics for this ethical claim, this ethical aim. While the details are different, this thesis statement may remind you of Ibn Tufail, or it may remind you later on in the course of thinkers like Ju Xi or Shanti Deva, whom we'll read soon. These people are all committed to the importance of understanding reality, not just for the sake of knowledge, but because it has implications for how we live. However, if it's true that understanding reality, or knowledge of metaphysics, is important for our purpose as human beings, we might be a little worried about how we're supposed to understand reality. Thinking back to Ibn Tufail, we saw that acquiring knowledge is not an easy task. There are pitfalls, there's stages involved. And so Nyaya is concerned not only with acquiring knowledge, but how we acquire knowledge. So we don't want our default to be dishonest debate where we quote unquote win because we've confused our opponent. Rather, we want to engage in sound investigation. We're after truth, we're after facts. For this reason, Nyaya is concerned with inference, which is one of the major ways that we can acquire knowledge of the world around us. Now, one of the major questions that Nyaya philosophers were concerned with is whether God exists. They thought the answer to this question was yes, although other Vedic affirming Hindu philosophers such as Mimamsa thought the answer was no, as did Buddhist philosophers, as we've seen. Now, in fact, Nyaya philosophers thought it was possible to come to know that God exists through inference. On their view, if I were to tell you an inference and you were to understand it and to come to believe the conclusion on this basis, then you know that God exists. They had many inferences to God's existence, but here's one due to the Nyaya philosopher that we read last semester. He says, the functioning of matter, atoms, and so on, is directed by an intelligent agent because these things are insentient like an ax. And just as how axes only cut when a person directs them, so too matter only functions when an intelligent agent directs them. This is from Uddiyotakura's commentary on the Nyaya Sutra. Now, we'll come back to this inference a bit later, but I want you to take just a second to think about whether you find it a good argument. Uh, these little icons that you'll see throughout the lecture mean that you can use the comment function, function in Panopto to add comments to this discussion question. So I encourage you to take a pause, think about it, add some comments, or come back to it later after you've watched all of the lectures. So before we go further, let's back up and learn about the context in which these questions are being investigated. This is in the 17th century, which is a time of great upheaval and change all around the world. The Ming Dynasty in China, which had been ruling since the 14th century, is overturned by the Qing through conquest. The Ottoman Empire, which begins in what we know of today as Turkey, continues to expand, fighting in modern-day Poland and Iraq. And in Europe, the long period of religious war, known as the Thirty Years' War, has ended after devastating much of Central Europe. France is rising in power with a series of increasingly absolutist monarchs. In Africa, the slave trade, which began a century earlier, is continuing, and the Portuguese in particular continue to trade with the civilizations of West Africa, and new European powers are beginning to show interest in the cont continent. All of this is going on at the time that Anambutta is writing. In keeping with the upheaval that characterizes the rest of the world, the subcontinent of India is home to significant conflict. In particular, the Mughals, descendants of Genghis Khan and the Mongols who were converts to Islam, they push into India throughout the 17th century, though it's important to note that Muslims had been in, in India for centuries before the Mughals. Their conquest of the subcontinent begins in the north, and as they overthrow the various local kingdoms, they establish a centralized government. At the time of Anambutta's writing, in Varanasi, also known as Benares, the empire was well established throughout most of north and central India. So the green arrow in the slide points to Varanasi. And at the left is a map contemporary to the time drawn by an English cartographer, an explorer named William Baffin, who was a member of the East India Company, and that shows the extent of their rule. While in India, the Mughal rulers varied in their tolerance for local religions and customs. Some rulers, like Abu Akbar, who rules in the early 16th century, were not only tolerant, but almost, almost welcoming of the collection of religions that we today call Hinduism. 
He abolished taxes on non-Muslims. He forbade enslavement of prisoners of war. And he even established a new state religion, which was basically called Godism, emphasizing the commonality among all religions. Other rulers, however, were not so kind, killing Vedic priests or Brahmins, levying heavy taxes on non-Muslims, and violently proselytizing for Islam. Regardless of these tensions, Mughal and Hindu culture informed and influenced each other at this time. The great Taj Mahal was built by a Mughal ruler, and local architecture took on some Islamic forms. Indian literature and philosophy influenced Islamic philosophical thought. One major Islamic worker, or excuse me, one major Islamic thinker works on translating the Bhagavad Gita into Persian in a quest to find answers about religion. And you might find it interesting to know as well that Rene Descartes, I think you will read in this course, his work is translated into Persian for this very same Islamic thinker to read, somewhere between 1656 and 1667. Whether it's re read more widely in India is a question we don't currently have an answer to. So during this time, during the Mughal reign, philosophy isn't happening within universities or a church hierarchy, as was the case in Europe at the time. Instead, philosophy was a matter of individual teachers attracting students. Philosophical families were common, and from philosophical father to philosophical son, these were pretty much men at this time, you can trace the development of ideas. A son would frequently reference his father in the text, make use of and expand on his father's ideas. So a family with a philosophical heavyweight or guru might lead a group of students, and as his work gets known, he could be invited to debate at a courtly event, which we see a sort of image of here. These events were public spectacles. The best debater would win a financial reward and presumably more students and some fame. So philosophy was not just about sitting in your armchair and writing a treatise, but about active engagement with an interlocutor that you wanted to best in argumentation. Philosophers wanted their arguments not only to be correct, but to be convincing. They wanted to convince the interlocutor, and failing that, at least the appointed impartial judge and the audience that their view was the correct one. And at stake was not merely winning an argument for glory, but convincing people in an increasingly cosmopolitan and intercultural context that your perspective about God, about the nature of the world, the nature of yourself, and so on, is the right one. And as was mentioned, I think, last semester in PPT, there are stories, probably ap apocryphal, of kings converting to a new religion based on debate. In part two of this lecture, we'll learn how one form of reasoning, inference, was used widely in these debates and learn about it from Anambutta.